Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, a member of the working group that will determine who gets frontline worker bonuses offers her perspective, and the head of the Senate Redistricting Committee outlines the group's progress. Plus, the Senate Republican majority elects a new leader. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The Frontline Worker Pay Working Group, comprised of three senators, three representatives, and three members of the Walls administration, held meetings throughout the month of August to develop a framework to distribute $250 million in bonus pay to frontline workers. Senator Erin Murphy is a member of the working group and joins me in the studio to offer her perspective. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. So there was much compelling testimony in the meetings from all kinds of workers, those in healthcare, meatpacking, corrections and law enforcement, food preparation and grocery, transit, and more. From all the testimony that you heard, what stood out? The real effort on the part of people that we asked to go to work at a time when we didn't really understand very much about the virus. And Minnesotans, as we would expect, said they want us to go to work, we're going to go to work, and they did. And across sectors and across industries, and as I listened to the testimony from people, whether they were transit workers or meat packers or they worked in an Amazon facility or healthcare workers, uh, they all experienced something profound, uh, something that uh, we don't fully, uh, we haven't fully reconciled yet, but they did an important job for the people of Minnesota. They kept us healthy, they kept us alive, they kept our economy moving. And I'm grateful, I've been very, very moved uh, by the testimony that I've heard. As you know, a divide has emerged among working group members. Uh, Republican members would like to see the $250 million focused on those in health care and long-term care because, as Senator Mary Kiffmeyer said, they knew they were interacting with the virus directly. The DFL members would like to see the funds dispersed more broadly. How are you thinking about this? I think we need to disperse the funds broadly. And the testimony is the proof that whether you knew you were interacting with the virus or not, people were exposed on the front lines. Uh, we heard stories from bus drivers, from meat packers, from janitors. Uh, people suffered uh, both health risks, uh, they got sick themselves, they lost uh, financial well-being, financial footing as a result of this. And so I think that we must think broadly to recognize and really reward the work of people across sectors. I am a registered nurse. Um, we take care of everyone. Mary Turner, the president of the nurses, testified at our very first hearing. Uh, and she, the leader of the nurses organization, said we must make sure that we are including everybody in this frontline pay. I agree with her. I spoke with one of the co-chairs of the group, Senator Karn Housley, last week on the program. And my first question to her was $250 million seems like a lot, but is it really? There's been discussion about a meaningful amount. And mathematically, if the pool of recipients is too large, then the actual hero pay will be smaller. What is a meaningful amount? And is $250 million enough? Well, meaningful is always going to be in the eye of the beholder. And while I think it is important that we, uh, we share this uh, $250 million broadly, uh, there's no way financially really to thank uh, the people who did this frontline work unless we were able to restore their lost time and restore their lost wages. And we're not doing that in this, in this proposal. I think we need more than $250 million. And we know that there's $1.2 billion uh, sitting on the bottom line right now that is from the federal government for this purpose. The American Rescue Plan dollars. That's exactly right. Um, and so uh, I know that $250 million is a lot of money. But there are a lot of people who did the work to keep us moving. And I want to make sure that we make a meaningful gift a meaningful financial frontline pay uh, for those people. So there was much discussion about risk versus fear, especially in the last couple meetings of the working group. Certainly nurses in COVID units and long-term care workers knew they were being exposed to COVID-19 on a daily basis. But as you said earlier, workers in other industries um, had financial impacts and perhaps had to quarantine or became ill. And, and so they did perhaps suffer financially because of going to work. 
Is the bonus pay legislation unwittingly pitting workers in different sectors against one another? So not if we think broadly, um, and that's why I think that's important. Uh, Minnesotans who were required to go to work, we said go to work, and they did, uh, faced risk for sure. I believe they did that fearlessly. They went to work. They went to where they needed to go despite not being clear about how the virus was being transmitted. Uh, that's not fearful. That is fearless. And I am always going to be grateful for the people who did that work, who said, yep, I'm going to go. Uh, and so if we were to choose uh, to only include a small sector, such as healthcare workers, at the expense of others, we would have pitted uh, risk. Uh, well, we wouldn't have pitted risk against risk uh, because they all experienced risk. We would pit worker against worker and give value to some and not others. And I think that's unacceptable because they all faced risk and many experienced financial hardship as a result. The other co-chair of the working group, uh, Representative Ryan Winkler, has proposed the idea that all eligible workers apply, um, the funds be split accordingly, and if that resulting amount of hero pay is too low, then the legislature simply pass more money. Is this a workable compromise in your view? So the reason why I think it is important that we remember that the legislature can appropriate more money is because of what Minnesotans did at the start and during the course of this pandemic. And the pandemic is not done with us yet, right? The virus is still surging. We're in our fourth surge. So I want to think a little bit about what it means for these individuals if they receive um, meaningful frontline pay, and then what that means for our economy as we head into this fourth surge, as we head into the winter. Uh, we have done a lot for different sectors uh, and segments of Minnesota during the course of this, whether it is for business owners or people who are unemployed, for the people who run our stages, uh, for our craft brewers and distilleries. We've done a lot of work. And if we pump $250 million into the pockets of working people and we add more to that, that money's going to go into the economy. So there's a value for all of us. That $1.2 billion, the, the remaining ARPA funds, that's for this purpose and we should use it for this purpose. By law, the deadline for the recommendation from the working group was Labor Day, which has passed. Group members have also expressed a desire to make sure that there's a unanimous agreement on how to disperse the funds. Yesterday, co-chairs Winkler and Housley released a statement saying that it's going to take more time, but that they will continue to work until an agreement is reached. What is your best guess on the outcome? So we're working right now to make sure that we understand what we think would be a reasonable number of people who would apply. And it's a concrete data piece that um, has been missing, and so there's work being done right now to deed uh, to figure that out. I would expect in the next week or so that we will have reached a conclusion, and I support the idea that we get to an a unanimous agreement. Uh, Minnesota's workers are waiting for us to conclude this work. And we've made a commitment to them, and I want to conclude this work. And I want to give a nod to the working group itself. There has been a very clear uh, sense that we need to work together to get this done. And for those who have been following along, we've heard a lot of testimony. But there have been a lot of questions and a lot of discussion among the varying persons on this group. And we have been working together very collaboratively, very cooperatively. Um, with intention, and I'm happy about that, and I think it's going to yield a good result for us. One final question on another topic, because you are also a member, member of the redistricting committee, which is, you know, beginning more and more meetings as, as a proposal from the Senate must come together. The House will have a proposal. We'll see where we end up. But can you just give me a few thoughts on how you feel like the Senate's redistricting process is going? So the Senate and the House are both behind, from my perspective, in terms of conducting hearings so that we can hear from Minnesotans. And you know, we in the Senate adapted principles, or we, we, we heard, we heard, we didn't adapt, but we heard principles during the regular session earlier this year, which is important. Those principles guide our decision making. The data, the raw data that we need for redistricting didn't come to us until very early. It was middle of August. I guess it was the middle of August. So we're behind, um, and I was grateful that we had a field hearing in Bemidji. Um, we need to do more of that. And for Minnesotans who are listening to us, please get to a hearing if you can and let the, the committee members know about what is special and unique about your district so that those considerations can be taken into account as we draw maps. 
Senator Aaron Murphy, thank you so much. You're welcome. The Senate Republican majority has chosen Jeremy Miller as the new leader for their caucus. Redistricting uh, clearly is one of the major issues that we're going to be discussing uh, along with um, bonding and um, what I shared with our caucus is a, is a clear path forward. Another issue that we're going to uh, try to address in 2022 is an issue that we're hearing about from many, many Minnesotans and that's the increase in crime rates. I, Thoroughly enjoyed my role as a Senate president, and I'm going to miss that role. Um, so it is a, a bittersweet uh, uh, moment. Senate Republicans are committed to distributing the $250 million that was allocated in a bipartisan manner uh, to the workers who are on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. I plan to work together with the governor, uh, Speaker Hortman, and members of the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle in a very straightforward and respectful manner. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be disagreements on issues, but what's often not highlighted are the many agreements that are uh, on the different issues that we have. In mid-August, the U.S. Census Bureau released the data necessary for states to begin the work of updating the legislative and congressional district maps in a process called redistricting. Senator Mark Johnson, chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee, joins me to talk more about the process. Thanks for being here. Uh, hi, Shannon. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back in studio yes. uh, doing this once again. Yes, it is. Um, let's begin with the logistics of the process. The Senate sure. is holding hearings. The House is holding hearings. At what point will the committee begin drawing maps and how will differences between the House and Senate be reconciled? Sure. So uh, this, is, this has been such a unique process. First of all, once every 10 years this happens to begin with. It hasn't fallen on a pandemic year like this since, you know, back in the 1920s. So uh, it's really, uh, we're having some real issues with data. You know, think about the, the folks who are out there working, developing that data, going door to door. Uh, trying to see who was home during this whole census taking. You know, you're worried about opening the door to strangers and, and the whole, just the whole works was, was uh, pretty unique. So it pushed back the collection of that data uh, quite a bit. The information we should have been seeing back in February and April and March uh, didn't come until, you know, we, we heard about the apportionment for the federal seats in, I think it was June when we actually heard about those and then uh, August, then we got the information for uh, the actual data that we can be using to draw maps. Uh, and so everything has been so much uh, further delayed. The hearings that we've had, you know, should have been done earlier in the year, but without the data, it's hard to know where we need to be and, and to see where some of the changes are going to be across the state. Well, that said, you did have one in Bemidji recently. We did. Yeah. So what did you take away from that? What did you hear from residents of that area? Yeah, and, and that was really, that was uh, just wonderful to go out and hear. It's not so much for, for us to go and educate people uh, about, you know, here's how the maps are going to be looking, but going there to understand the communities that we're going to be, uh, you know, affecting through this map drawing process. So, so everybody from, you know, counties to townships to, uh, we had some, uh, tribes coming, they were, they were testifying, just all these different folks who have an interest in seeing uh, how their communities are going to be either joined up or split or, or how it's going to look. Um, so we got to learn more about that particular area and what was interest, uh, what interest they had in redistricting. And, and that's our plan going forward too, is, is stopping at different areas. We've got one set for Lakeville here, I think it's September 30th. Where we are again going out and educating ourselves on what's important about this area and, and we want to do that to get a flavor of minnesota because we all come from different areas right i mean think of, of the makeup yeah. right and one of my takeaways from watching that bemidji meeting is they're really concerned about rural representation mm -hmm. and 
you know, the census data shows that 78% of Minnesota's population growth did occur in the seven county Twin Cities metro area. And many people assume then that means there will be more districts in the Twin Cities. But, uh, you know, there's the, oh. the balance with rural areas and rural representation and the uniqueness that those rural areas have. So I, I wonder how you're thinking about that. Yeah. Well, it, it is interesting because, you know, we're, we're before our state was, was more spread out, as far as population was more evenly spread across the state to, to some, you know, respect. But you see now, especially in the seven county metro, where that's really consolidating. Um, and I think rural Minnesota is, needs to gain a, somewhere between 50 and 60,000 seats to become our ideal district sizes. Whereas a metro needs to shed about that amount, you know, so it, it's, it, a lot of that is going to be moving in towards the cities, which, you know, it, it's a numbers game. I mean, it's absolutely about the numbers and districts have to represent evenly the numbers. So 67 districts and divide that by the, the number of people living in the state. So it's clearly, you know, our, our rural districts are going to become larger districts. I already have in my district where I drive from corner to corner, it's a three hour drive. Uh, in my district, and you have some of the in the cities here where that might be a 20-minute drive or something like that. Um, but it, it's just the nature of redistricting and the nature of population growth. So we want to make sure that it's fair, the process is fair, the representation is fair. Minnesota has done a really good job of that. Think about whether it's the House or the Senate or the governor's office and how many times each of those bodies have switched between an R and a D uh, in the last... 10, 20 years. I mean, I think uh, what what we've done in redistricting in the past has been very effective for representing both sides of the political interest in the state. So um, that's something that we're going to continue uh, to do in a very fair and open way. And that's why we're doing all these procedures publicly and, and getting the input from everybody. It's not, not just directed at one particular side. So this is also going to, this population change, shifting populations and, and the growth mm -hmm. around urban areas is also impacting the congressional districts, which fortunately, yeah. according to Susan Brower, who was on the program last week, Minnesota State Demographer, Minnesota did a fantastic job yeah. of completing their census forms so that we get to maintain our eight congressional representatives. Yeah. But how, you know, as you sort of mentioned, there's innumerable ways to redraw these districts. And what are maybe some of the factors that are going to help you determine how the shape of these districts changes going forward? Sure. Yeah, Minnesota, first of all, congratulations to Minnesotans who got that done. Because we beat uh, New York, the state of New York, by 89 people to maintain our eight congressional districts, which is a big deal. I, I don't know if people realize how big or if this is getting too much into the, the weeds of, of redistricting. Well, it was close. <laughs> it was certainly <laughs> so, close, yes. It, it just amazes me how thin the margin was between us maintaining that eighth seat and us losing that eighth seat. Um, so we're in, a, we're in a very good position because if we, had, if we would have lost that eighth seat, that means that our congressional districts would have been a blank slate for the most part. And how do we draw that out completely going from brand new um, now it's, we'll be able to adjust the borders of those to make sure that you know it represents the communities, but we don't have to start from whole cloth and, and try to design um, what our congressional representation looks like from the ground up. One more question I have for you. The census did reveal that Minnesota's white non-Hispanic population has declined to 76%, while the black indigenous people of color and multiracial groups have grown to make up almost a quarter of our yeah. state now. Voting rights groups have filed a lawsuit seeking to ensure that people of color are represented in the redistricting process. To what degree should those demographic changes impact the drawing of maps? Yeah, so we've got, we want to make sure that our maps are representative of Minnesotans as a group. And, and we have a number of principles that the courts have been using for years and years. And, Everything from, you know, making sure that, that the districts are compact so you don't have those funny looking gerrymandered districts where we've seen them in other states, Illinois, and, and where you, well, that district doesn't even make sense. But compactness is one, communities of interest, the, you know, all these different factors that go in. I think there's about 10 different criteria that the court really looks at to see 
well, what does this what does this mean to make sure that we get one vote per person and we're trying to stay in with everything from the the voting rights act to just precedent set by our courts uh, in the past to make sure that that all of our maps come out very fair and the process that we follow is very transparent to everybody that so they can't cry uh, follow on any of this so we're, we're very cognizant of, of what's going on uh, in in front of everybody. You mentioned that you have a meeting coming up yeah. in Lakeville, yeah. September 30th. How many more meetings do you think you'll have around the state and why should Minnesotans come and tell you what they think? Oh, so I, I really enjoy So we got the opportunity to go up to Bemidji, uh, which is close to home uh, for me. And then Lakeville, for me, it's really a great experience just to learn about every community is different. Every community has something unique to offer. So come out, explain what it is that, that we need to be paying attention to when we're drawing those lines. So I'd really encourage folks to, to come out and be part of that process. Senator Mark Johnson, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the time. We close this week with a look at gubernatorial portraiture in the Capitol. The official state portrait of Mark Dayton, the 40th governor of Minnesota, was recently unveiled in a ceremony held in the rotunda. It hangs in the west wing of the Capitol on the ground floor in a corridor with Governor Tim Pawlenty, Governor Jesse Ventura, and around the corner, Governor Arnie Carlson. These are all portraits though, paintings, not photographs. Why is that? Well, the importance of uh, oil on canvas is the permanence, because if you had a photograph, that's going to fade over time. And so the, the goal of the Minnesota Historical Society and the Capital Area Architectural Planning Board is to have a piece of art that's going to be there for decades and generations to come. So you want something that's a traditional uh, oil painting on a canvas. These paintings differ remarkably over the years. Uh, Alexander Ramsey, Henry Sibley, those are small paintings. Some, like Governor Arnie Carlson, are quite large. What explains the differences in the size and how these paintings are, are the decisions that are made? Yeah, that's a really interesting story to tell about the portraits because what you are looking at is you're looking at portraits from the 1850s all the way up to the present day. and so you get a really good story about art history and how portraits were done. So you have very traditional, very formal paintings from the 1850s to the 1890s, early 1900s, the traditional governor with the hand in the, in the coat, you know, that type of thing. And then you start in the 1930s having a little bit more personalization of the governor. So Floyd B. Olson was the first kind of a little bit more um, less formal painting. He's portrayed standing in front of the Capitol. The Capitol's behind him and he's holding a microphone of a, for uh, the radio. And he was one of the first governors to really use that technology to have these statewide conversations over the, over the radio. So that was kind of a nice little kind of a part of his administration as a governor and a part of his personality, very charismatic, very outgoing. I noticed in Governor Arnie Carlson's portrait, there are two butterflies, a blue and a yellow, and a yellow bird. Also in uh, Governor Jesse Ventura's, there's Rodan's The Thinker, and there's a train in the background. What do these symbols indicate? Well, it really typifies some of their achievements as a governor. The process for the last several decades is the, the governor, when, when they finish their term of office, gets to select their portrait artist and also what they want to be portrayed as or how they want to be remembered in that portrait. So they worked with the artist to work out some of those details. And so once again, if you look at some of the more recent portraits from the, in the last 30, 40 years, you do have characteristics or things that identify that person's interest. So we can go back to El Cui he has horses in the background. Well, he's an avid horse rider and has been his whole, whole entire life. So those are his horses that are being portrayed in that, in that painting. And you have Arnie Carlson as the butterflies. One is a, a butterfly you find in Sweden. One is a butterfly you find in Minnesota because he has Swedish roots. He's a Swedish American descent. So, so it, it makes the things very personalized for these uh, governors to have those stories told in the portraits. As you view all these governors' portraits, uh, some are seated at or near a desk, some have books or flags. Governor Tim Pawlenty and Governor Mark Dayton, as is Governor Floyd B. Olson, outside. How are the settings chosen? Well, that's a, a 
kind of a conversation between the artist and the governor. So they can uh, pick and choose what they want as their setting. And uh, for instance, with Plenty, uh, you know, that typifies this was the center of, of government. This is where he worked. This is where all of his uh, achievements were made was in that capital. Uh, with uh, Governor Dayton, it's really acknowledging, you know, the importance of the state capital. But he was also the leading official that led the preservation, restoration, repair of the capital. So that's a part of his legacy. That's something that you want to be remembered. Not only did you serve here, but it's a place that you help preserve for future generations. One portrait is distinctly different from the others, and that's the one of Governor Rudy Perpich, because it includes his wife, Lola. What's the story behind that? Well, the tradition for any governor portrait is to have just the governor as the person in that portrait. Uh, what uh, Governor Perpich had served non-consecutive terms. So he did have his first official portrait on display here, but because he had served a second term, he wanted to have that first portrait and a new portrait on display in the Capitol. And the Capitol Area Architectural Planning Board said, well, you can only have one representation. And he wanted to have his painting uh, with his wife, Lola. And so that brought up this whole controversy about it should be just the governor, and so he was, uh, asked not to have her in that painting. And so he had a campaign, basically put billboards on University Avenue, you know, saying that they're not letting me and my wife in the building. So, you know, it just became kind of a, a, a sticky issue for several years. And then after he passed away, the family and other supporters got money to do a portrait with Lola in that painting. So you'll see Lola and Rudy in the same painting today. Each one of these portraits has uh, a plaque next to it explaining the accomplishments of that governor's administration. Who writes those? That's uh, overseen by the Minnesota Historical Society. So we have, we contract with historians or other people to write those uh, biographical plaques and the information. Is the content ever controversial? That, that's the problem if you have portraits of living people or be, being portrayed. It's, Sometimes it's hard to really tell their story because they're still living that story. So sometimes that can be a controversial issue. Um, with the older governors, you know, you have a little bit of, of time to really see what the permanence of that legislation they might have been supporting, the effect that has. So you have a, a better idea of the impact that that governor did have, you know, 100 years ago. In a sense, these portraits uh, tell the history of the state uh, through time. What do visitors do, do, they, do they comment ever about these portraits? There's a lot of people who will, you know, as they're walking through the building, are curious. They want to see who these people are. They, they know some, they recognize some from their lifetime, and so they're interested in reading about them and seeing them portrayed here. And, and people usually comment, it's nice to see these portraits here because it does reflect that history of Minnesota and the different people that have served as that executive officer. next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.